Jesus, you are magnificent. Absolutely. You are worthy, Jesus, and we are so unworthy. And we thank you for grace. This morning, Jesus, I ask, we know that you are speaking, but would you open our ears and open our hearts, I pray? Jesus, we know you are here, and we welcome you through the doors of our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 12, we're going to talk about faith in contrast this morning, and... All, this will be the, the last sermon on the Gospel of John before I go. The next couple of weeks we'll, we'll do the Christmassy jingle belly thingy for the next couple of weeks and just focus on Christmas because that's what we should be doing every, every day but we'll focus on it in December while we're here. Uh, it's a great time of year and we should be celebrating Christ in December if none other time. But today we come to John chapter 12 and from here on in, the, uh, it's been a pretty heavy Gospel in a lot of ways up to now but from here on in, it, it gets a little bit heavier as well. Jesus has a lot that he wants to say to his disciples before the cross. There's a lot that he wants to say. If you can imagine you're about to be taken away, what would you want to say to those people before you? What's, what's your final word you want to be, be saying to them? We'll, we're going to look at that when I get back next year because 13, 14, 15, 16 talk a lot about the Holy Spirit and a lot about Jesus is leaving and the responsibility we're left with. But John has one goal we know in the Gospel of John, and that is that he tells us in chapter 20, I have written these things that you may believe. And he doesn't want us to leave this Gospel wondering, I wonder what he means by that. And today, in this chapter, I don't want anybody to leave here today wondering, I wonder what it means by that. And we're going to contrast faith. John's been doing it the whole, the whole gospel, John's been doing it. He usually uses the Pharisees and says, have a look at this, will you? These guys are seeing the same miracles, they're dealing with the same man, but they're responding differently. So he's contrasting what it looks like to believe. And uh, I've watched snippets of a movie that I want to watch the rest of, and I encourage all of us to watch. It's called Do You Believe? It's an interesting movie, and it challenged me deeply because there's an there's a African-American man carrying a cross, and he comes across another man, and he says, do you, do you believe this? And the guy in the car says, yeah, I'm a pastor, of course I believe it. He says, I didn't ask you what you do. He says, I asked you if you believe this. And that radically changes the pastor's life. A completely different trajectory from then. Do we actually believe this? And I wonder what that looks like in our lives. Some years ago, it would be three years ago now, I can remember preaching a sermon at Lagana. It absolutely rocked my boat when I looked at this. And I was, I was actually preaching on the life of Joseph. Well, he's one of my favourite characters in the Old Testament. And there are so many parallels between Joseph and Christ. But I remember preaching on Joseph. And through the course of studying it, I stumbled across uh, an incident with Moses. And Moses, we understand, he, he, he leads the Israelites out of, the promised, out, of the, out of Egypt into the wilderness. And he never actually makes it to the promised land. And there's an incident that happens at the waters of Meribah where he, God says to Moses, speak to the rock. And Moses hits the rock. Same result, the water still comes out. But later on, God says to Moses, because you did not sanctify me as holy in your heart. That's the original Hebrew. Because you did not sanctify me as holy in your heart, you will not go with the Israelites into the promised land. I thought, wow, Moses? Moses misses out. This is a guy who you pushed his face into the cleft of a rock, Lord, as you passed by. This is a guy that spoke with God face to face. This is the guy that got the Ten Commandments twice. And I started wondering what that meant. And I also realised it in, in the epistle of Peter. Great epistle. We'll spend some time in the epistle of Peter sometime next year. But the first epistle of Peter, chapter 3, verse 15, everybody loves this verse. But they always quote the last part of it where it says that we should be ready to give a good defence. And we should be. But don't forget the first part. To honour Christ as Lord in your heart. And the original Greek is to sanctify him as Lord in your heart. And whenever we sanctify something... The word means to take something from a position of ordinary and place it in the position of special. 
And three years ago, I said, Lord, sanctify yourself as holy in my heart. And I warn everybody in this room, think twice before you pray that prayer. It will not look like what you think it will look like. One of my heroes of the last century, William Booth, who founded the Salvation Army along with his wife, Catherine Booth, says, I've shared this quote before and I will share it again, because it is prophetically speaking to the 21st century when William Booth says that the chief danger of the 21st century will be religion without the Holy Ghost. It will be Christianity without Christ. It will be forgiveness without repentance. It will be salvation, mark this one, It'll be salvation without regeneration. Politics without God, who would have thought? And heaven without hell. William Booth was absolutely correct. Have a look around today. There is, there is too much salvation without transformation. There is too much, forgive me, Lord, without being on our knees asking for repentance. There is too much of, I want to go to church and punch in the time card and no Holy Spirit. We don't believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus left the Holy Spirit for us. A.W. Tozer writes a complete book on this about reclaiming Christianity. And he says that we leave the Holy Spirit behind so often. That we want the form, we want the legalism, because it's safe. And it's easy. Oh, the Holy Spirit. (laughs) He's a messy fellow. He'll mess you up. (laughs) He will mess you up. Thank God. Thank God. The Holy Spirit helps us to work out what God works in. And that's the aim of what God wants to do in each and every one of our lives. Ravi Zacharias speaks of it like a tapestry where if you have a look behind any tapestry, you just see random threads going all over the place. It doesn't make any sense. But if you look at the other side, all those random threads are beginning to form a very beautiful picture. And God weaves all those random threads of our life in an attempt to produce something beautiful. That's what he's doing in our lives. I don't want church without the Holy Spirit. I I don't want church without Jesus. I don't want salvation without transformation. You might be sitting here this morning and you might say to yourself, that's not possible. It's not possible. I go to church. I believe. Mm, Yes. I've also seen people sit in church pews for many years and not believe. Sad. Let's have a look at our Verses today as we look at John chapter 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. (laughs) Yes, you did. Verse 2, so they gave a dinner for him. So they should. For Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. So we see that they are throwing a dinner for Jesus and this account that we're going to go through today is recorded in every gospel. Jesus said it would be. Jesus said wherever this is told, the story of this lady will be told. In fact, by the time we're finished looking at the life of Mary, we're going to have a look at what worship actually looks like. We're going to have a look at what church should actually look like. When we walk through these doors, we should be like Mary. We're going to have a look at all of that. But they throw a dinner for Jesus, but There's some facts that have been omitted here that are consistent in the others that we need to know that sets the scene. In fact, this dinner is held at a Pharisee's house and that Pharisee is secretly a leper. The Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Mark tell us that Simon is a leper and he invites Jesus for a dinner and Jesus accepts. There's an interesting note about leprosy. Whenever we read of leprosy in the Old Testament, it speaks figuratively of sin in the New Testament. And if you have a look at all the lepers in the New Testament, not one of them were healed, (laughs) and every one of them were cleansed. And the effects that leprosy has on somebody physically is exactly the same effect that sin has on a person spiritually. The first important truth to know about it is, Jesus is the only one that can cure it. 
Jesus is the only one that can cleanse your spiritual leprosy. And if it's left unattended, it will eat you away and desensitise you. So Jesus is having a dinner at a leper's house. Somebody hears about it. Mary, who is this Mary? What's going on here? This is not the mother of Jesus for a start. It is Martha's sister. We know Mary and Martha. Martha's busy about serving and Mary is at the feet of Jesus. Of course she is. We know that this Mary is also the sister of Lazarus. We know that it is this Mary that is likely the lady that was caught in adultery in John chapter 8. It is this same Mary that Jesus will say to Simon the leper, those who are forgiven much, love much. Mary got something that a lot of other people missed. We will see that Mary just gets grace. (laughs) Mary got it. Mary got the fact, Jesus, I didn't deserve for you to do anything for me. Jesus, I was a sinner and you set me free. Mary gets it. So many people picture the Christian life as a boxed up life of rules and regulations and legalistic ways, but grace changes the words I have to to I get to and I want to. What a privilege it is, Jesus, to serve you. Mary gets grace. She understands that she's been forgiven much. In Luke, we are told that she is a sinner. (laughs) Aren't we all? A lot of us are so much like Mary. Mary does something very different here. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard. We need to understand what's going on with this ointment here. This ointment is the key to everything that is going on here. This expensive ointment, we will see, equals about 300 denarii, and that would be a year's wages for a peasant. So in Australia, that equals about $60,000. In the US, it's $90,000. And in Europe, it's about $150,000 to $160,000. Depends on the currency of the euro at the time. But we understand that it would take a lady who probably got this by means of unreputable ways. Women didn't really work, but she has been able to save this up. This would have equated to our life savings. Imagine trying to save 60,000 or so dollars. In fact, this ointment to Mary would have meant everything that she had. This would have been possibly passed down through the family, but what the contents of this jar would have been considered extraordinarily valuable. In fact, nard is a perfume that is expensive because it is imported from a long distance away and it is extracted from a Nepalese plant, which takes a lot of time and a lot of plant. And perfume was considered to be very valuable at this time. So we see that Mary has expensive ointment and she does something very amazing with it. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. This is not a secret act because the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. When the Bible speaks of anointing, what does it mean to be anointed? Well, let's have a little bit of a look at that. Anointing is an ancient custom that shepherds would use, as a matter of fact, because sheep tended to get lice and other bugs that would climb up the sheep and get near the ears and inside the ears and actually kill the sheep. So the shepherds formulated a way to stop this, and that was they would take oil and smear it and rub it into the head of the sheep. And every time these bugs would get to the head, they'd fall off. And it absolutely alleviated the problem. But symbolically in scripture, to be anointed is to be consecrated and set apart for office. We see that people were anointed for the office of king. We see that people were anointed for the office of prophet. It's a setting aside. It's a, it's a consecration. It's a, you have, it's a round hole for a round peg. That's where you are. It's setting you aside. People were also anointed as builders. Or you were anointed, as I believe Jesus was, for a special purpose. I don't think Mary actually gets what she's doing here. I don't think Mary actually gets the fullness of what she's doing. But Jesus' feet will be anointed for a special purpose. 
for the purpose that he came to die for us. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus, you've got to be careful murmuring about Jesus' people because Simon the leper begins to murmur about Mary. You see, Mary comes into Simon's house and she pays absolutely no regard to Simon. She pays absolutely no regard to any of the disciples. Mary's complete focus is on Christ. This is not an accidental happening. This is not something that, oh, I just happened to carry this expensive perfume with me, Jesus, while you're here. No, this is completely and utterly premeditated. This is exactly an act that has been planned by Mary. And when she gets to Simon the leper's house, a Pharisee, she pays no attention. And she's intently focused on Christ. And Simon begins to murmur. And now we begin to see a little bit of a glimpse of the difference of the heart. And Jesus says to Simon, I want to ask you a question. Do you see this woman? Because really the only person in the room that actually really sees this woman is Jesus. They all view her and wish they couldn't see her, but Jesus sees her. And Jesus says to Simon the leper, he says, you know what? When I came into your house, you didn't give me any water for my feet. Disrespect. And when I came through your door, you didn't give me any kiss on the cheek. Disrespect. But from the moment this lady has been here, she has not stopped wiping my feet with her tears or in kissing my feet. Have a look at the difference. The difference is that so many people consider everything in the world to be so valuable and so often Christ to be so cheap. But all the difference we see in Mary when she considers Christ to be invaluable and everything in the world to be so cheap. That's the difference. Mary is at the feet of Jesus and she will pour out everything that she has at the feet of Christ. That's what worship looks like. Every Sunday we come through these doors, you should forget everybody else. Forget the week. Forget what's happened and focus on Christ. I've got a news flash for you. Worship looks like we are totally focused on Him and not focused on us. Mary doesn't care what they think about her. Mary doesn't care what Simon says. I don't care what you say. I'm going to worship Jesus. One of my most favourite words in Scripture. Problem is, it's either a good one or a bad one. Just as in life, you get good butts and bad butts. So in Scripture, you get good butts. Like in Ephesians chapter 2, you know, where, where Paul's... Actually, Ephesians is actually a prayer. <laughs> When you break it down, it's one big prayer of Paul's. But Paul's, Paul outlays that we were objects of wrath. By nature, we were objects of wrath. But, oh, thank you for that but. But we have a but now. And every time you have a but in Scripture, we're flipping the coin. We're, we're, we're having a look at the other side. We're having a look at a switch or a contrast. And that's exactly what's happening here. John wants us to know, look what, Jesus do, look what, look what Mary does for Jesus. This is what worship looks like. But, but what? But Judas Iscariot, he's an elephant in the room, isn't he? Let's be honest. (laughs) Everybody reads the Gospels and goes, Lord, why Judas? Jesus stayed up all night praying, and after an all-nighter in prayer, handpicks his disciples. But why Judas? If you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, you know what, Judas was born to betray Christ. That's wrong. All of the Gospels, when they list Judas, they say he became a traitor. You don't become something you were born to be. We mix God's divine knowledge up with God ordaining it to be that way, but you can't remove the fact that Judas Iscariot lives with a choice. But what hits my heart the hardest is, how does a man spend three years in the presence of Christ and still be so far from him? And the truth of the matter is, we see in the person of Judas, forget the betraying, forget all of that. What we see is, you can actually be close to Jesus, but ever so distant. You can hang around Jesus and not be near him at all. 
And John doesn't want us to miss this. John doesn't want us to miss the fact that you can spend a lifetime in the presence of Jesus and be so distant from him. Judas Iscariot, we will read in the next chapter. If you read the next chapter, we will see that right up until Jesus passes Judas the morsel of bread, that's when Satan enters Judas. Up until then, he's running by his own choices. He's already plotted the betrayal of Christ. And have a look at a lady that comes and brings $60,000 worth of ointment and breaks it at the feet of Christ. And now have a look at a man that will sell him out for 30 pieces of silver and ask yourself the question, who values what the most? The 30 pieces of silver is the price for a slave. Judas Iscariot would sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, now we're, now we're going to start to see the heart of Judas. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Fair question. What a waste. No. No, no, no. John tells us what the problem here is. But because he was a thief... He said this, not because he cared about the poor, sorry, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Oh. John chapter 6. John, we sing a song called Indescribable. And there's a line in that song that says, Though you know the depths of my heart, you love me. And in John chapter 6, Jesus said, Did I not choose you, the twelve, yet one of you is a devil? And here we see Judas Iscariot. Jesus knows he will make this choice. Jesus knows that he will dip his hand with his enemies. Jesus knows that he will betray him. He says, Judas, I love you. I know the depths of your heart, Judas, and I love you. But we see a heart exposed. Where's Judas' heart? On the things of this world. He was a thief. And he's, he's reminiscing an opportunity missed. This could have been sold. Imagine how much of this I could have put in my pocket. And sadly, to our detriment, there are many today that hang around Jesus because they see physical benefits. I love what Jesus says. Jesus says, leave her alone. Judas, leave her alone. And the imperative here is he is speaking to an individual, not to a group. He rebukes Judas. Judas, you can hide behind whatever you like. You can put up this facade of being a disciple. You can, you can put up these screens. Simon, you can wear all the clothes you like. I still know you're a leper. And in fact, <laughs> half of Jerusalem know you're a leper. You're not holding it very well. But don't we do the same sometimes? Don't we try to put on more clothes sometimes? Don't we try to put up a facade that we hide behind? I'm, I'm Jesus' disciple. Jesus knows the heart. And Jesus says to Judas, leave her alone. She's worshipping me. D.L. Moody says, the world has yet to see what God can do with and for, and through, and in, and by the man who was fully and wholly consecrated to him. I will try and be that man. I want to tell you about a friend of mine who for many years thought, you know what, the, I, the most important thing is that I work hard. The most important thing is that I do whatever I have to do to get ahead. The most important thing is that I make sure that I, I make enough money for my family, I make sure I make enough money and I'm setting up a kingdom here and, it's, and I have to do all of these things and if I get to church, that's great. Um, I'll, I'll fit you in when I can, God. And over the course of time, this, 
this friend of mine began to realise just how temporal things are here on this earth and just how eternal Jesus is. And just how willing God is to strip the things of this world away from us so that our intent and focus is completely and utterly on him. I wonder what God could do with a church full of people that are wholly consecrated to him. Jesus needed 11. That quickly grew to 120, waiting in the upper room. That after one sermon went to 5,000. See what happens when God's in charge? See what happens when the Holy Spirit's moving? I wonder what God could do in your life if we broke open the alabaster jar at the feet of Christ. As I bring this to a close, I'd ask the worship team if they could come back. And I want to ask you some questions this morning as I bring this to a close. First of all, what value is it that we each place on Christ? We see a difference here. The contrast is in value. What value do we place on Christ? Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. If you treasure the things of this world, this is where your heart will be. If you treasure Christ, that's where your heart will be. John Piper says that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. What would happen if we got radical? Radical belief Looks like radical action. Jesus is the most radical guy I've ever known. What a radical guy. He did things completely differently. He spoke differently. He acted differently. What if we got radical? I wonder what the effect would be. I leave you with this charge this morning as we conclude the Gospel of John for this year. I leave you with this charge to pour out your flasks. Pour out your flasks. Empty them at the feet of Christ. And allow him to be the value of your heart. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you that we are everything to you. I thank you, Father, that you poured out everything for us. And I pray that everybody in this room would pour out everything at your feet. Father, I ask that you would radically transform our hearts, our values and our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.